Hi there everybody, Sophie Aldred here, aka Ace from Doctor Who, and you are listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name's Dwayne, and we have a special edition of the show today where we're going to be featuring one of the very first, well, the very first interview that we did with Janet Fielding in our live events earlier this year. But before we get to that, because of the success of our earlier live events with Janet Fielding and Sophie Aldred, we've been in a position to bring you a couple of more live events. In October, we are bringing Katie Manning to Sydney and Melbourne. So you can get your tickets and more information at our website, katiemanning.sirensofaudio.com. There are links to more information and tickets there on the website. Jump over and have a look. But to give you a taste of what is to come with Katie. If you haven't been to one of our events before, we are happy to share with you the first interview, as I said, that we did with Janet uh, at on, uh, it was the 1st of April, no kidding, 1st of April this year, and it was uh, Janet's introduction to our Sydney audience, and it was a privilege to have her in town after such a long time, and uh, she gave the fans a great time and spent a lot of time with them, was very hands-on, and I think everyone there really enjoyed the smaller Doctor Who-focused event that Philip in particular was able to put together. So so much gratitude from me to Philip for putting these events together. And uh, yeah, so we just want to share that first interview with you, just to give you a taste of what our events are like. Um, this was held at our location in Parramatta in Sydney and I'll come back with you after the end of the interview. Hope you enjoy it. Hello. Good morning. G'day. G'day. Indeed g'day. I did not know that Parramatta meant eels. There you go. I follow the eel historian on Twitter and he's just great. He's full of eel fab uh, facts, but I think he's based in the USA, and I don't think he knows that Parramatta means eel, so I'll be able to tell him that. Yes! <laughs> yep, there, there is a reason why the Parramatta Football Club have eels as their... Oh, yeah, do they? Yeah, so the Parramatta eels. Ah. Who's, who's local? Who, anyone local? Anyone? A few oh, locals? Wow. I love your hair. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. it's great. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah. That yeah. like pointing out people in the audience already just to make them uncomfortable. Uh, Janet, welcome. Thank you. So good to have you back in Australia. Oh, so good to be here. How long has it been? Well, since I was in Australia. Since you were Australia last time. Okay, so I was back home three times in 2019. That was a bad year, though. That, both my parents died, yeah. And I was already committed to coming over for one of my youngest brother had his big birthday. He turned 60. I know. I could just... I can't believe that's true. But he's 30 years older than you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, because we've got to mention it's been 40 years since you started in Doctor Who, so I yeah. guess, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, it is 43 years since I started. Wow. And I was 27 when I started. Oh, people are doing the maths now. Yeah. You're happy to give away your age. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I'm still standing. You know, that's a plus. <laughs> I'm still shooting Cybermen. And thanks to Sophie, uh, so Sophie Aldred, rather. Oh. I used to, her married name. Sophie Aldred, I'm still running up and down damn steps. <laughs> and every time we went for another take, I said, you and your action hero. <laughs> So was it like, it's, it's, it's a 43 years since you did your first films with, yeah. with Tom. Is, is it, I kind of say, once again, watching those clips, I just, 
made my heart sing about certain sort of emotions and just the qu- quality of what was there. That scene, just that beautiful scene where you come in with Tom and just the way he just sort of lifts himself up. It just sort of it says so much. And the way that you actually did work with Tom, I know Tom was a bit strainful in terms of it was a bit hard with him. Yeah. Well, I was the first. I think I was the first uh, companion he hadn't had a say in. I'm not sure. No, that'd be right, actually. Yeah. Although I'm not sure whether a first female companion yeah. he hadn't had a say in, because I'm not sure about Matthew, yeah. um, whether he had a say in Matthew either. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. So you just suddenly appeared. He hadn't met you and given his nod. Yeah. Um, I guess because he was going and he, they didn't yep. need his nod. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So what, what sort of mood was he when he on set? Was he was he melancholy? Was he? How did you find him? Um, a bit remote, if I'm honest. A bit remote. But then, you know, that often happens in series. And then you get to know somebody over the course of the thing. But I wouldn't claim to have ever got to know Tom. Whereas I got to know Peter really well. And, you know, Peter and I had this sort of jokey relationship. Um, Any of you who used to follow us on Twitter or ever seen film footage of us at events, uh, we spent a lot of time taking the mickey out of each other. And he is extremely cruel to me. (laughs) Poor little me. It's not like I ever do anything. <laughs> um, so he's, um, yeah. And I mean, it's really quite funny, Peter and I, because Peter was the only male in a family of three women, three girls, three sisters. And I'm the only girl in a family of three boys. So there's a sort of mirror image dynamic there. Yeah, so, yeah. That, that, that playfulness that you and Peter have, yeah. verging on viciousness, um, <laughs> when, when did that start? Was that actually why we started working together? Was it more later on in conventions? That was more later on, yeah, in, in conventions. Because we used to see each other, um, you know, uh, really reconnected in the 90s because we were, we and still are, members of a club called the Soho House. So Pete, Peter was there because... He was um, doing shows in the West End so often he'd go there afterwards, meet up with people afterwards there. And I was there because I was an agent. So I would take um, my clients there or casting directors there and, uh, with, with the clients. And so we reconnected uh, via the Soho House, funny enough. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Why don't we just talk a bit about power of the doctor because it's the most recent yeah, thing you've done yeah. uh, who saw who's anyone he see the power of the doctor a few people yeah there you go yeah um can i i mean can i say by far my favorite jody episode it just blew me away and emotionally i was yeah. so taken away um you're one of very very few companions who've been invited back yeah so they didn't know you very well yeah or, yeah uh, <laughs> um how did, how did you... I didn't get much of a reaction, but never mind. <laughs> how did you first get contacted? How did, how did this come about? Because you haven't acted... Because after, after you left acting, we'll talk about it a bit later, but you became an agent for a long time. You worked for a women's well, organisation. I, I first of all... Because um, what happened in the 80s was that it was a really bad time for women yeah. in the industry, in the, in the film and television industry in particular. Um, I mean, there's... Only like one in four, less than one in four roles are for women anyway in um, traditional drama, Um, even less in Shakespeare. And um, anyway, so it it was obvious that there were very few roles for women and, and, and in the 80s. And one of the tropes that was coming through was the only woman in a male world now, that's great as a storyline. It is great, you know. And, and, for instance, Prime Suspect, that's, that's the premise of Prime Suspect, you know, is that Helen Mirren is the only woman in this male-dominated enclave. And, and it was a great feminist piece. But in terms of actresses, they were very few roles for women. And um, that, was, that was true generally. And I thought I could either accept that or I could try to change it. So I got involved in trying to change it and um, I was one of the people who, I wasn't on the first board, but I ran it. Um, 
So I was one of the people who helped start Women in Film and Television UK. Um, it had been going for a while in, in Los Angeles and New York. And then I started it, I was one of the people who started in, in the UK and I ran it for the first four years. And within 12 months, we were as big as the UK chap, uh, as the New York chapter after 12 years. So that was amazing. Showed that there was a need. And things have gradually changed. But, you know, and then I, then I got headhunted, as it were, to, um, to take over a very established agency. And, um, and uh, yeah. So you've always been an advocate for actors. Yeah. Well, initially, because um, I was, you know, a volunteer and doing a lot of work um, for the board when we were getting ready to start Women in Film and in the UK. And initially, they weren't going to accept actors. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Um, because when it comes to the pointy end of discrimination, <laughs> actors are right there on the front line. I mean... You, you're seeing stuff come through now post the Me Too movement where, you know, you've got um, intimacy coordinators on set and it's about damn time too. You know, that was a huge thing. Do you want to, if people don't know, do you want to explain what an intimacy coordinator is? Well, you know, it, it's famously true that a lot of actors have to get their kit off, you know, and do bedroom scenes, often with somebody you've never met before. And, um, you know, it's really, you know, there were no rules back in the day and people got away with all sorts of completely unacceptable behaviour and in a professional situation and that was, nobody was doing anything about it. But nowadays, you know, we've come a long way but it's taken a lot of lobbying and things like that for the culture to change, you know. But that was, th I'm talking about 30 years ago, you know, and the struggle 30 years ago, so... Very difficult, very different times now. Thank you. Mm. Still ways to go, but we're getting there. Yeah. Then you decided, big heart, you started a charity. You've been working at a charity work for yeah. a decade or so? Yeah. So I worked as... Um, uh, I, I went off to write, actually, and I got a couple of commissions and nothing got made. And, um, and so I... Uh, I, I worked as a head of finance at a charity which uh, researched um, marriage and partnership, which I thought was an interesting, uh, if you were writing. And then um, I started a charity in Ramsgate. I left that charity and I started my own charity because I'd moved to Ramsgate in England and there was a lot of deprivation in the area because it was a coastal area. And... Um, I worked with young people and um, doing a youth arts charity because, you know, middle-class kids are three times more likely to do out-of-school um, activities and so we were trying to... We were providing free act arts activities, especially the visual arts, which is not my field, but we kind of stumbled into this thing with photography. I can't take a photograph to save myself. Um, you know, everything's blurry, it's badly framed, you name it, I'm rubbish. Um, but I hired people to do that and then the kids would take photographs and we would then work with an artist to show the photographs in a, um, in a new context so that the kids got an idea that they could do things, you know, because a lot of them had been told that they were a waste of space. And um, and they weren't, and yeah, and so you were trying to show them what success felt like, mm -hmm. and and um, anyway, if you uh, Google fantastical Turner, that is the last project we did. So I'm now passing the baton on to another group called Ramsgate Arts Barge. Yeah, I mean, sorry, yeah. that's long-winded, isn't it? No, it's great. I mean, it's, and it, once again, it's building self-worth. The people who feel successful can become successful. But when you've grown up in a situation where you've never known positives, um, and, I, and I, think, I think many people in Doctor Who fandom uh, attracted Doctor Who because people, no matter how different, how distinct, have a place to come. And I think that's what Doctor Who's always done, and you were doing it in terms of people on the coast and yeah, continuing that love on. You have to have 
a link between effort and reward. You have to. If you don't ever see any uh, reward for your effort, you lose the desire to, to do that activity. That's just the way it goes. Brilliant. So you were doing the, all these different activities, all about helping people, sustaining yep. people, but acting was something you sort of put aside. You, you came back slightly because Big Finish caught you back. Actually, it was all the fault of Todd at the back. Yeah, because in 2003, I think it was 2003, yeah, he organised a fan convention in Sydney. And at that fan convention was Gary Russell, who produces big, was producing Big Finish. And Gary Russell is nothing if not a nag. <laughs> I hope somebody's videoing this so that you that Gary can hear that. Um, he sent me a very rude message yesterday via Catherine Cranston over there. Did he not, Catherine? About venom. Yep. I told him that it's okay, Gary, we've found a new spider in Australia. There's no, no anti-venom for it yet, so I'm getting a spider for you and I'm taking it back to England. <laughs> anyway, so... He, I, I, sorry, I didn't hear that. Spiders are beautiful. Mm. If you look at my Twitter feed, it says arachno-wuss. <laughs> sorry, there's no going there. That's just a line I'm not prepared to cross. I respect them, don't you worry. Uh, anyway, so... Um, Gary said, okay, come and do, do, you know, come and do one for me, please, please. So after nagging me all weekend, I finally said yes. I said, but I'll only ever do one. And then I had a great time. And it turns out Toby, who runs the studio where we used to do all of the Doctor Who's, the, all the big finish until COVID, um, Toby is the best cook in the world. The lunches are spectacular. You have to fight Peter Davison. For the, so Peter has a chair. This is, used to be. The, Peter had a chair right next to the door to, the, to, the, to where the, the lunch was set out. And we used to always try and make sure that if Peter went into the studio to record his bit and you weren't in it, you could somehow block his access. <laughs> to the food. Um, so we just had the best time. I'm, you know, and we, that's really when it started, when we started taking the mickey out of each other big time. And, and I can't remember who it was that we had, you know, because we have some really cracking guest stars, but somebody was in there and he, they went, what is it? I mean, you know, that things are, are bad between those two, aren't they? And, and David Richardson, who was producing, said, no, that's w what they're like because they're fond of each other. If they're polite to each other, I worry. So that's how it goes. Oh, I feel better now with how you treat me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. So, so <laughs> Gary, Gary took you your word and kind of killed you off. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, she's only doing one, we'll kill her. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cheeky. But then he brought you back young. Yeah. It's always nice to do. So you've been with Big Finish now yeah. basically 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Now you can't get rid of me. No. So um, we'll chat Big Finish a bit more later with people. I mean, Dwayne and I, of course, are big, big, big Finish fans. Um, yeah. yeah. But so you, you, Quite that, right, that, too. That was really the only acting you were doing. Yeah. So when did you hear from Cardiff? Well, yeah. So By the way, I love what you're wearing. Oh. It looks kind of familiar. Yeah. So, and thank heaven it's cool in here. Um, I was getting worried. Um, yeah, so I get an email from Julian, who handles some of my convention appearances in England and America. And he, he sort of said, uh, I've had this message from Andy Pryor, the casting director. Are you interested? And I went, oh, okay. 
hmm, should I do this or not? And so, I, but you you always leave the door open. So I went, I sent back and said yes. And then, um, so Andy Pryor came through to me direct. Um, I don't know why they didn't go via, because my old agency is now called Gordon and French and I'm still have a, you know, I'm very great friends with Donna, who's the um, who's the French part. Um, Gordon has long since gone, but and um, yeah. So I said, well, uh, yeah, okay, and um, and then so I heard been, nothing so for weeks. I heard nothing. So that's only July, and we so it's July twenty twenty. One. one. Yeah, that's and July 2021. And this is before scripts are written. They haven't shown you a script. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. List. Are you going to so do a it? Few, and, then, and then it was suddenly all systems go. Uh, after like three or four weeks of not hearing anything, I get a phone call from Chris Chibnall and hadn't done a deal or anything. And Chris and I, he asked me what I thought Tegan had done and how she'd developed since then, what her life might have been like. And so I told him what I imagined it would be, and um, and that's how uh, the character as she is now is kind of focused, and 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 uh, and Sophie went through the same process, and so from like early July, I think it was early mid July, um, and then my costume fitting was on August thirty first. And then started filming? Uh, a couple of days later. Whoa, okay. And, and, uh, yikes. <laughs> and the other thing was, because then, after the conversation with Chris, I thought, okay, it is Thunderbirds are go, you know. And, and then I was paranoid about COVID. Oh, if I get COVID, they'll recast me, blah, blah, blah. And so I focused on that instead of being terrified about the fact that I was going to be on camera, until the first day of filming when I thought, ah! <laughs> you know. And, um, it, yeah, so it, in my day, you, you rehearsed. So you'd go out and you'd do, a, first of all, you'd do a read-through. So you'd hear how the other actors were basically going to approach the, the part. Then you'd go out and do the filming and you'd get a sense of, of where things fitted. And then you'd go into the studio, you'd rehearse for 10 days, record for two, re re rehearse for 10 days, record for three days. So those be long studio days, you know. You called very early in the morning and you finish after 10 o'clock at night. No, not now. You just get on and do it. Eek. And we didn't even have a read through. COVID. So, at what point did you did you get a whole script, or did you just get your parts? We got a whole, I got a whole script, but it kept changing. I right. mean, it, th th there were alterations to it. Okay. So, what was the first scenes you filmed? Was the first scene? Oh, uh, with the phone. By the water. In which I could see my own face reflected. <laughs> I said, sorry, you're going to have to tape over this. I thought, oh, good heavens, I look so old. Um, how do I angle my face so that I don't look so, ooh, really? Do I look that bad? You know, I never said I wasn't vain. That never happened, okay? Nor do I believe that plastic surgery is necessarily a bad thing. I'm just too afraid to get it done. But I may overcome that fear. You never know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, okay, so th th when did you when did you know Sophie was in it? When, when Chris oh, immediately. Immediately. Yeah. So, uh, but I had had a hint. I had had a hint because people had said that Chris Chibnall wanted to bring us back. And I thought, oh, that's you know. And then of course, you know, we had to keep it secret. Nobody was allowed. You had to sign a non-disclosure agreement in which they, you know, they agreed to take your firstborn and 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 you know, all your assets. If if you know your 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 house, your home, everything, if you eat so much as whispered that you were in it, and um, 
And so, yeah. So you had nine months or more after you'd finished filming before... Not quite, because I had... So we film, finished filming in, I think, the last time... last day I did was reading in for Peter when he was doing his stuff. Um, the last day was in November, early November, and then April, Easter... When the they showed, I think it was the flux. The sea, de- oh, the sea devil. No, the sea devils. It was yeah. the sea devil story, and I, um, the trailer went out, and oh my heavens, my um, Twitter feed just went berserk. I've never seen anything like it. Russell T Davies emailed me to say, you know, bit busy on Twitter, you know, blah, blah. yeah. So. And then when it went out, he was really sweet and sent, sent some nice emails. And Chris Chibnall was just lovely to us. Were you expecting the part to be as big as it was? No. No. <laughs> no. That was terror. Absolute terror. Yeah. Because just learning lines, I hadn't had to learn lines. And, and I can't stand it when I see actors lying with their eyes on camera. And you can tell they're not in the moment. And I worried that if you were searching for lines that that would be possible. But actually, I seem to have crossed... That That was fine, as far as I can tell. Um, it was really funny because we had a pre-release screening and uh, Peter Davison uh, said to me... I said to Peter, I'm dreading it. I hate watching myself at the best of times. Um, I go back to the vanity thing. I'm vain, and I think, no, I'm much more gorgeous than that, surely. Um, and, uh, you know, so I said to Peter, oh, heavens, you know, and he said, look, the, um, I always watch something twice because the first time all you see is you and all you'll, you'll do is pick it apart. He said, you need to see it twice. So I contacted Chris Chibnall. And Chris very kindly sent me a link so that I could watch it before the press release screening. Because could you imagine being there and seeing yourself up on screen for the first time in 35 years? 37 years, I think. uh, Without having seen it first and you're sitting there with a load of press. Yeah, that, you know, that's, that is not fun. That is just not fun. So um, that's what he did. And in fact, we had a great night. That was just wonderful. And somehow Doctor Who fans in the area, because it's a big university area, so there were a number of Doctor Who fans in the area who happened to notice that we were there because they'd seen people arriving and they sort of all were crowded around outside the cinema. Yeah. It feels like you slipped straight into it. I mean, that, you're saying the first scene was the one... You're on the phone. You're having a conversation with Sophie who's not there. You've got someone yeah. reading in lines. You're yep. outdoors. Yep. Thrown in the first time. Yeah, it, it, there's, it, it, there's buzzing. There's planes going overhead. No, cut. <laughs> Go again. You know, all of that was going on. It feels like you have just slipped straight back into the role, though. Did it feel like it's where you were sitting? Because No. As an audience? Okay. No. I just <laughs> felt naked terror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, did you f- stop feeling terror by the end of the shoot? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. And, you know, Sophie and, and, and Gemma and I sort of were hanging out a lot on this, you know. And, and Patrick Kane, you know, who's so wonderful. Doesn't he look frightening as the Cyberman? Hey? Oh, my, my, my. What a brilliant, brilliant costume and makeup that is. Ray Holman, the costume designer, was just splendid. Really splendid. And, and Jamie Stone, who's done the direction, I think... Brilliant. We're going to hear a lot more of Jamie Stone. So what was it like working with Peter on screen again? Oh, yeah. That was, that was lovely. But, uh, you and know... The fact that you were a lead and he was just a secondary character, did you enjoy that? <laughs> I think you can say I might have exploited it. <laughs> so <laughs> what had happened was Jody. by the time he came down to do his stuff, Jodie had finished um, her, her work. So what they did was they um, they gave me her Winnebago, and it's huge. I mean, it's the size of this room almost. It seems so. You know, it has 
a not only does it have its own bathroom, its own dining room, its own living room, its own double bedroom. I mean, this is a house on wheels. Um, and they gave it to me and they put Peter in a two-way, you know, a little... And all you've got... I mean, you do have a loo, um, you know, and it's separate, but, you know, it's pretty basic. And um, so I might have rubbed, rubbed it in a little bit <laughs> that the crew had done this. Didn't run him round, come round for drinks... When I got back from lunch, there was an eviction notice that he'd had made for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now, in terms of... So, um, it was all supposed to be secret. No one was supposed to know what's all going yeah. on. How hard was it to not be noticed in Cardiff? Well, thankfully, we were wearing face masks. But, you know, I'm aware that there's a big fan base in Cardiff. Huge. So... Sophie and I never went out together. Je Sophie, Sophie, Gemma and I, we didn't go out in public together. I wore my face mask if I was wearing out, walking outside even most of the time. Sunglasses, you know, the work, so that I was anonymous. However, when David Bradley, Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy and Paul McGann came down to film their little sequence, they were all staying in the same hotel. And they went for dinner in that hotel. And there was somebody there, one of the waiters who was a Doctor Who fan, who wanted a photograph. So he took a photograph of the doctors and he tweeted it. Anyway, yeah. Well, of course. I mean, they, they, I'm sure their NDA didn't count not being tweeted <laughs> together with others. Yeah. So what, what, what for you in terms of the whole power of the doctor thing was the thing that you enjoyed the most about the experience? I think working with everybody and being part of the, you know, very directly involved with the, the series. You know, I do watch the series um, now and, I, and have done since it came back. Um, I love the modern series. I think it's brilliant. Um, but was there part I, of you I sort of always hoping that you might get asked? I guess so. I mean, I never really thought about, it, if I'm honest, until fans started tweeting that there was a rumor that that and and as it was coming towards the end of Chris's run and nobody had contacted me, you know, Chris Chibnall's run as showrunner, I thought, oh well, it's not going to happen. Oh well, <laughs> but. So you talk about you and Sophie and Gemma, who yeah. plays Kath, Kate Stewart, yeah. all gone really well together. There's some rumours around about the three of you doing an offshoot spin-off. I know. And I, I promise you, I haven't heard anything. But if there's an NDA, you'd have to say that. I would. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, you know. Tweet away, guys. If you wanna, <laughs> if you wanna let Russell T know that that's what you'd like, far be it from me. To in any way. So, if you were asked, would you do it? Yeah, of course I would. <laughs> no hesitation. Are you kidding? <laughs> Listen, that's fantastic. It's uh, twelve o'clock. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have a lot more of you during the day, which is gonna be yeah. fantastic. But people um, would, I'm sure, would love to have photos with you now. And oh, really? In costume. I know. Okay. I do. Um, so, uh, just so you know, actually, why don't we let Janet leave and you can go have a drink of water and just have okay. a break. So, would you please thank Janet Fielding. We hope you enjoyed that little excerpt from our day with Janet Fielding in Sydney earlier this year. And I hope it gives you a little bit of a taste of what is to come with Katie Manning coming up in October. So, once again, that website is Katie Manning. Dot sirens of audio dot com. We've certainly had a ball bringing these events to you uh, in April and May, both with Janet and Sophie Aldred so far, and we're very much looking forward to uh, to what Katie has to offer the fans. What's What's great about these Doctor Who personalities is that their their love for the fans is always the priority, 
and they have a deep desire to spend time with you and uh, to give you as much value for your dollar because all these things cost money to put on. Uh, they hope to give you as much value as they can. So making these events a little bit smaller, a little bit more intimate, gives us the opportunity to do that. Also gives the guests an opportunity to spend lots and lots of time doing interviews, Q&As. The day with Janet, we had quizzes. Um, we had quick fire question rounds as well, plus autographs, photographs, things like that. It was it was uh, a, a, a wonderful event with with a total focus on not just Doctor Who, but on a specific companion from Doctor Who. So we're looking forward, as I said, to bring that to you once again. So a little bit of a different format for today's episode of The Sirens of Audio. Hope you enjoyed it. We will return to uh, our normal uh, type scheduling and programming next time. Uh, but for today, hope you enjoyed that. And we look forward to being with you again next time. Catch you later. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 167, Janet Fielding live in Sydney with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us and tickets to Katie Manning in Australia from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of this episode or you can contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audio files. We'll hear you next time.